How's it going, everyone? Um, we're super excited to be here. Thanks for having us. We are going to talk about how you can hack Google AdWords for your startup. Um, and you can go into a little bit about our backgrounds, but really what we wanted to do is just give back to the Galvanize community. We've taken a lot from you guys. We've done a lot of events here. Um, and we're, we're pretty knowledgeable about this stuff and wanted to help you as much as we can as you sort of begin your journey with paid advertising. So the sort of general theme of the presentation is relatively basic. We can get as complex as you need to. We just didn't know what sort of level you guys were at. So we started at a pretty basic point. So Todd, why do you introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, Dan and I spent the last two years at Google. Uh, we were on the AdWords team. We actually spent the last, the second half, uh, only working with startups. So we worked with a lot of fixed arts companies, but mostly companies that raised Series A and beyond that were looking to grow. So that's really where our specialty is. And we know a lot of hacks. I've, we've done this a lot, and we've seen a lot of tricks and tips. So I'm excited to share that with you before Google. I was at AOL. So I know the uh, maybe older AOL tricks and the newer Google tricks. Yes, yeah, so like I was saying, I was at Google as well, working with a bunch of startups like you guys. It was a very scale, early startups to companies that were spending, you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars a day on their just Google digital advertising. Um, so we really got to work with a lot of different scale levels. But one thing that we, we learned was that the majority of companies just typically suck at, at serving visual ads. Um, before Google, I worked at a startup in Boston called Smarter with online skill assessments. I ran all the marketing and biz dev for Smarter. Um, while I was there, and, um, and we ended up getting acquired uh, by companies all these people called Pearl Sites. So I got to see the cool transition of like early stage, like fifth person at the startup to you know, the subsequent scaling of, of the company. And we're currently in text across the street. We'll get into more of that later with some questions. But if you do have questions, use the hashtag and up. Uh, we'll kind of take them from there just so we can organize it. All right, so what we're going to cover today. Um, we want to go through quickly just like setting up a basic Google AdWords account and what that looks like. There are some tips and, tri tips and tricks that you can sort of know beforehand while you're sort of creating the basic foundation of those campaigns. Uh, we're going to take a look at ad extensions. And everything that we cover today are things that most people get wrong when they're setting up their campaigns for the first time. They're also the biggest drivers to affect change as far as return on investment or success sort of down the road with AdWords. One of those big things is ad extensions. The second thing is maximizing your return on investment with ad targeting. Um, the, the next one is demystifying quality score, uh, which is something that before I worked at Google, it was like the bane of my existence, right? It was like, how the hell do I get this quality score up? I didn't understand how to do it. Um, and working at Google, we, we sort of we learned a lot of the tips and tricks to, to make that more effective. Uh, and the final thing is AdWords secrets that everyone should know, but no one does. So we'll go over that with you guys as well. So one of the things here is is why AdWords, right? And let me ask one quick question. How much money do you think is spent every year advertising on Google and Facebook? Does anyone have a guess? Last year, how much was spent? 800 million. 800 million. Anyone have any guesses? 3 billion. Four billion. We're gonna to have to get a little bit higher. Eighty yeah. billion. Eighty billion? You're the closest. Give that guy. Give that guy a prize. So <laughs> Seventy-two billion. Seventy-two billion dollars a year was spent on Google and Facebook. Facebook uh, Google contributed about two thirds of that. Um, so it's about fifty billion dollars a year that's spent advertising on Google alone. The reason why people do it is there's high ROI if you can crack the code to, to do it successfully. You'll get instant traffic to your site when you do it. So it's not like SEO, where you're trying to figure out how you get Google scrapers to actually serve your ads for specific keywords. Um, you can do everything with Google AdWords, search, display, or marketing, app installs. You basically cover the whole digital suite by, by just using AdWords. And your competition's already using it. So if you're not throwing your hat in the ring, it's stealing business from you guys. Um, but there's one important thing to remember, and that's even when you do do it, you're probably going to mess things up. Right from the very start, you're probably going to mess things up. And it's really not your fault. And, and when Todd and I worked at Google, we literally talked with thousands and thousands of different companies. And a very small fraction of them understood even the basics of AdWords. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. But the biggest reason is that Google really hasn't changed things much in the last 12 years. They pretty much use the same dashboard and have just subsequently added features and more features and more features to sort of fit the needs of all the different advertisers that are using the platform. A lot of the stuff you really don't need. 
Um, so it just weighs things down and it gets confusing. So look at the next slide. I mean, this was the, sort of one of the first versions of AdWords. This is the new version. They're almost identical, um, except for the fact that Google is just crammed more information in, more features for you guys to take advantage of. But they're not necessarily features that every single advertiser is going to use. So you want to make sure you know what things you must get done when you first start these campaigns, and what are things that you can sort of throw into as you begin to find success with AdWords. And we're going to cover a lot of those things that you need to do during the competition. So I want to go over setting up a campaign for the first time. For some of you, this might be repeat, or for some other people, there are things that you can miss. So I'm going to walk through on our own account how to set things up. Uh, so let me just pull up. Quick poll of the room. How many, guys have you, how many of you guys set up an AdWords campaign at least once? OK. okay. All right, cool. cool. So if you're signed up for AdWords, uh, really basic sign-up process, but it'll take you to this screen. Um, so the first thing you want to do is hit this plus campaign tab, and you'll have the option. Search network, display network, or Google Shopping, or online video. Just want to explain the quick difference between them. Search network is when you type into Google and you say locksmith or plumber. So that's people typing into Google and those text ads that come up on top or on the side. Uh, the display network is Google has access to any website that has AdSense on it. So if you're putting uh, AdSense on your site, Google has the ability to serve ads on it. So these are websites like AOL, uh, CNN, but also a lot of blogs, like New York Times, but a lot of blogs out there. So these are sites that Google has partnerships with, but this is not Google search. So you really need to decide what you want to advertise on. The display network lets you do image ads for marketing. So if someone comes to your site, doesn't sign up or buy your product, and you want to follow them around with your product on the internet, that's what you would do on the display network. Search network is all text ads. Your Google Shopping, that's if you type in you know, cameras and you see a number at the corner, a bunch of images of products you can buy. That's Google Shopping. I would say any e-commerce business, that is the number one thing you should do. And then there's video. So that's YouTube. Uh, before you watch a, a video on YouTube, you can target people with your own video. I'll get into the nuances, but those are the differences when kind of picking one. So I'm just going to go through a search campaign first. So what you want to do, obviously, is name it. But before you do that, you want to make sure it's on all features. This is like the number one thing people get wrong, which is ridiculous. This just gives you more features and more customization. Whereas standard, you have to go by their rules. So you always want to bring in all features. We'll call this test galvanize. So name it whatever, obviously, you guys want. Let me go with the other options here. So this is a big uh, a search campaign. If you're interested in mobile app installs, it'll just walk you through a little different setup, but basically the same thing. You want to change it there. And then the only other one that I would suggest is the call only. So if your business just wants phone calls, you would want to do a call only campaign. The setup is the same, but it will only show you on mobile devices. No desktops, only mobile devices, and you actually pay for a phone call. Get into that okay. Down here is where you pick, pick your network. So Google Search also includes Google Search Partners. So for instance, on AOL, when you search something on AOL, search, come, search terms and reports come up, those ads are served by Google as well. So the search network is like intent, right? You're typing in a word and getting something back. The display network is a bunch of sites out there that people are browsing. This will allow you to show on Google and some of the partners we have. The good thing I'm showing on those, the CDCs might be cheaper, but if your goal is really just to show on Google when people are searching, you probably want to get rid of this and I would recommend that. A lot of times, 90% of the budget is sucked up on search partners, and you usually get higher uh, conversion rates with just Google. So that's the first thing you'll miss. Then you want to pick the location. Again, you can choose the United States and Canada, all countries and territories, or you can just choose where you want. So San Francisco. So this would only be targeted in San Francisco. You can get down to the uh, zip code, neighborhood, state, region. Um, you can get really deep in there by going to advanced search and we'll get that in a bit as well. Next, you want to put in your bid. So this is how much you're willing to bid uh, when someone clicks on your work. Uh, the way AdWords works is it's really like a bidding platform. So the higher you bid, the higher on the page you go. The first three spots are average position one, two, three. Those are the ones on top of the page. And then you have four, five, six, seven, eight on the right hand side of the page. So if you're ever looking at your AdWords account, you see your average position is a three. The easiest way to get that up to a two or a one is by bidding a little bit more. Uh, so we'll put in a, a, a bid right now of three and a budget of 
one hundred. So that's saying every time we click, we're willing to spend three dollars every time anyone clicks on our keyword, and in total, we only want to spend a hundred dollars per day. So I'm going to skip through this and show you on the next page. Save and continue. Okay. I would suggest just canceling new ad group and doing it right from here. So the first thing you need to do is create an ad group. So ad groups are stored within a campaign. So you have a campaign, let's say it's a handyman campaign. I want to have an ad group for uh, fixing fixing refrigerators, uh, fixing cars, and fixing your oven. Uh, the reason you want to separate those in different ad groups is because they hold keywords and they hold ads. So if someone types in Fix my oven, you want to make sure a certain ad comes up. If someone types in, fix my fridge, you want to make sure a certain ad comes up. The best people I've ever seen will hold five keywords in each ad group. If you really want to get a little crazy, you can do one keyword per ad group so the ad is like exactly what the keyword says. Uh, but you really, these are like subgroups within the campaign. Does that make sense? Cool. So I'll set up the first ad group and show you kind of what it's like. So again, let's take let's become a handyman. My first ad group would be stove. And I create an ad for you know, handyman stove fixer. Obviously, you probably want to come up with something a little better than that. <laughs> Give it a description. And you want to put your URL in there. One big thing here too is remember, like the ad space actually does make quite a bit of difference um, as far as getting people to actually engage with your ad. And they're, they're making these decisions in fractions of a second, right? So adding a thing like uh, a simple call to action, right? Call me today. Um, we'll do a lot to get people to engage with it. Uh, and this is just by looking at the data that we've seen. So folks that have it, we'll promote them. So the big thing here, probably the biggest thing you can learn from this entire stream is you want to make sure your keywords match your ad text. So these keywords are going to trigger this ad. So you want to make sure that every all of these keywords have to do with this ad right here. And that's why the whole point of having different ad groups. So what I want to play here is broken stove. Uh, fix my stove. You know, things that you might think um, people will search in based on this ad that you want to come up with. Now, the one thing every single person gets wrong, and I can promise you while you're setting up, you won't get confused, is the match types. Um, so let me go through those. So you saw us adding in keywords. Here are the, all the different types of keywords you can add in, and this is like really, really important. Broad match, broad match modifier, phrase match, exact match, and manager match. I'm going to try to go through these as slow as possible, but definitely let me know if you have questions. This is like, Number one thing people get wrong. Um, are you sending these out? Yeah, I'm sending these out. Uh, so, broad match. This person sells hats. If you put the keyword in women's hats, it can include misspellings, synonyms, related searches, and other relevant variations. That's if you just put the word in with nothing around it. Broad match modifier is plus signs. So, if you put a plus sign next to women's and a plus sign next to hats, that means the word women and the word hats has to be in the search term somewhere. So this will include variations. This will not include variations. So if you definitely only sell women hats, you want to put a plus sign next to each word. If you just sell women and you can let hats broad, because it might be hats, it might be uh, another type of hat, that they might not say hat, but this is exactly, they need that exact word in there. Same thing for, so a better example would be a, a buying a guy looking for ads. I don't want to see women's hats, right? Because I should be looking for ads for myself. The advertiser would be smart to, to make sure that this term women is included so that only women uh, or people that are typing in women's hats are the ones that are seeing that ad. Anyone searching for men's hats will not see that ad because women isn't included. Yeah, so again, the plus I mean that word has to be in the search or the keyword ad will not be shown. Then you have phrase match. So this saying that the phrase women's hats has to be in there right next to each other. So you'll see women's hats, the phrase is right there. Whereas whereas broad match, you can say women and hats in any order. So I would suggest using broad match modifier over phrase match, because you don't know if people are going to say hats for women or women's hats. Phrase match is that exact phrase. Broad match modifier, those words has to be in there somewhere. And then the last one would be exact match. So this is 
women's hats, nothing before it, nothing after, exactly like this. Um, if you really know exactly what your your user search, that might be the best answer for you. But I was just starting with something like broad match modifier, because that allows some other words in there, like for, and things after, and things before. Exact is literally that exact, nothing else, nothing before it, nothing in the middle of it. Yeah, the, the rule of thumb that we works with at Google is any two word uh, phrase, you, um, you're probably going to want to start into one sort of phrase match, because at the end of the day, like, you'll probably want to do it together. Three or more, you probably wanting to use broad match modifier. At the end of the day, if you have to look at the data to figure out what's going to work best for you, that'll be the most important thing that you guys should take away from this conversation is always refer back to the data because it'll tell you what's successful and what isn't. But just to clear up one thing here, the symbol is what makes those keywords different, right? So when I add a plus sign into the women's or the ass, that means it's turning that keyword into a broad match modified keyword. If I use the brackets, it means that that's an exact match keyword, etc. Um, so just another good thing to remember as you need to fill out these campaigns. Yeah, and the biggest mistake is people just put in a bunch of broad match words, like stove or fix my stove. That could come up for literally anything, like fix my stove book for free or Craigslist stoves that are for sale. That has nothing to do with you. So I would stay away from broad match. If you do use broad match, just know that at the beginning you're going to be getting a lot of irrelevant traffic and you eventually have to go in from there. So I just want to show you how practically you use that on the same screen. So as I was typing in these keywords, what I could do was stove repair. That means stove has to be in the phrase, has to be in the search. Repair can be a synonym. So repair, fix, whatever Google thinks a synonym might be. You do a phrase like this. Sorry for the space, don't need the space. But that says that this phrase has to be in this order somewhere in there. And then lastly, like we said, exact. So that means that, oh, right. so that means that exact phrase has to be in there, nothing before, nothing after, nothing variable from this, that exact phrase. You might want to do that for your own brands um, or for some of your competitors' brands, but I would stay away from exact match. Yeah, a lot of people will want to jump to exact match because they think that, you know, well, I want people to see my ad when they type in this specific thing. But what it does is it just, it sort of eliminates a lot of potential eyeballs that would be interested in purchasing your product if they were typing in a variation. You shouldn't have to like force your users to guess what keywords you want them to type in. You should give them a little bit of leeway. Then you put in the bid. Um, this is kind of a guess, to be really honest. You'll know based on some data that we're going to show you how to, if you should increase or decrease it. But just, again, how much you're willing to spend for someone to click on your ad and come to your site. You can gauge up that and then go back and forth. So you click Save Ad Group, that's one ad group. Um, I would highly suggest creating multiple ad groups. We usually say about five ad groups per each campaign. So just so you know, here's my campaign. Here's my one ad group. I can go and create another ad group by doing the same thing I did before by clicking plus ad group. Within the ad group, is all the keywords we created and the ad we created. If you want to put more ads, just like that, more keywords, just like that. So you want to make sure, again, the ad groups hold the ads and the keywords to keep it relevant. Um, does that all make sense? Cool. I'm going to pause this. Yeah, we don't want this to run. So what we're going to cover now is we created our basic campaign, right? And that's pretty simple. Most, most people can get that pretty effectively. Google does a great job at walking you through those important steps. Uh, but there is a bunch of other things that you'll need to do after the basic foundation of the campaign is created in order to see some success when you sort of first out of the gate. The first one is making sense of ad extensions. And so, just want to click over to the next slide. Ad extensions are, are awesome because they're totally free. All ad extensions are free. And they do things like make your ad text a lot bigger when they're ranked at a certain, in a certain way. Or give you more words to include in your ad and more direction to give your users to make the friction uh, less when they when they sort of hit your site. Um, so the, the sort of key thing here is that there's a, there's a couple different uh, extension types. We'll go over them quickly right now. Uh, you want to use every single one that you can that makes sense for your business. Uh, and we'll go over what that means in a little bit. But the first one I want to cover is site link extensions. So you guys, whether you probably realize it or not, have interacted with site links on more than one occasion. So basically, four additional links 
below your, your core app. So you have your core app at the top, which is right here. And so this one could say like, you know, Nike shoes, right? Um, Nike will then have four additional links right underneath that ad that might be for custom women's shoes, custom men's shoes, children's shoes, and ask us anything. It basically is a way for you to direct users to very specific parts of your site. Um, and again, it's making your ad double the size, right, when you add in all this information. Um, so when you're a user, and I'm typing, typing in Nike shoes, and I'm a guy, I'm looking for men's shoes, I can just click that button, it takes me right to that section of Nike's website, and it doesn't allow me to like hit the website, try to navigate it, if the website's shitty, then you might you know, sort of risk having a customer fall off. Uh, it just directs the user very quickly to that, that, that point of place. So, I was going to show you how to do this right now, um, but there's a couple things you want to keep in mind when you're building these extensions. Um, you're given 25 characters in each section, and we'll show you that in just a second. Um, and you want to make the, the sort of content in each site link actionable, right? So come up with some sort of call to action that's going to, again, cause that, that user that's seeing your ad in those fractions of a second to quickly click on it and get to your site. That's the goal. Um, they're a little bit varied, so again, we're going to walk through it real quick. Yeah, so here's the campaign we built. Again, it's just to build ads, keywords, and ad groups. These are the campaign levels. You want to go to this ad extensions tab, and then here are all the different extensions we'll go over. First thing is the site link extensions. Again, these are free. They make your ad bigger, and they make your quality score better. So like, there's no reason, if you if you have a reason not to, it's a one-off situation, but you should be using as many as possible. So you click on site links. You get plus extension right here. And you can see we have four builds already, but I'll show you how to build. So you get plus new site link. Link text. So I want to say contact us. This will take you to tryahub.com slash contact. And then you give two set description. So the easiest way to contact us, reach us now. Something like that. I can save. You can see right there, active on the right hand side. So the left hand side is a bank of all the ones I've ever created. Let's say I also want client resources. This is the client resources page. I can add that as well. So when I hit save on this, the ad will now have my top ad and then two links below that say contact us, client resources. Can't get two different pages with a description. This, there's no reason you shouldn't have these. Um, the one thing I want to make sure you you don't do is when setting this up. You can select start in dates. If that makes sense to you, maybe there's a promo running and you want the promo code underneath, but you might want to click a start in date for that. And then if you don't have a mobile site and you have a specific URL that you want to send people to mobile, you can add the mobile URL in um, if your current site is a mobile optimized. So we know there's a lot of steps here, and we basically just wanted to sort of run you through it, like AdWords with tricycle, not a tricycle. Um, we have videos, we've recorded videos of all these different things for you guys to take a look at that basically is doing what we're doing right now, just walking you through each step to get to where you want to be. So we'll give you that link towards the end of the, of the chat. So it's that you know they're active, right? So contact us, client resources, should be active when I need all my ads. Uh, that's how you do that. So the next thing we'll take a look at um, are callout extensions. Callout extensions function in a very similar way as cyclings in that they give the end user more information about your company, right? Uh, the, the big difference is that they're they're not they're not links, so they won't go anywhere. They're just again maybe another line of text for you including your ad. So a good example of this is is basically creating some sort of uh, of difference between you and your competition, right? So if you offer 24-hour customer service um, seven days a week and your your competition doesn't, be a great thing for a call out because it's of information that you want that end user to take away from reading your ad. Same thing with free shipping or price matching. 100% um, money back guarantee, free app, free something. These are site links. So you see the site links here. You can also see the call out extensions here. So they're very similar, but these actually click to a page. These just are your ad next on the These are brand new uh, within the last couple of months. So adding these, you probably have an edge over your competition. So show you how to add these as well. Very similar to how we did it. Make sure you're on ad extensions. This drop down holds all the types of extensions. Call out extensions. Plus extension. Again, I have these in here already, but I'll hit plus new call out. Free shipping. See, if you click this mobile box, 
It's only mobile. So if you want it on both, don't click it on. Dave, you'll see it's over there. I want this one as well. I'll drag it over. Hit save, you'll see they're active. So very similar to the site looking extensions, but these are not clickable and these should be you know a really quick thing that since you guys are part of. So just one quick thing, so we don't have to do this for every single um, extension. You toggle on the extensions from this view here. Um, this is probably one of the most confusing things for most advertisers is like, they say they see setting the extension but nothing else. You can get any extension from this view. They all look pretty similar, so just make sure that the correct uh, view is toggled on before you make those changes. We're going to cover call extensions um, and location extensions in just a couple seconds here. Um, so call extensions are really good if you're looking, if you're driving sales through some sort of phone call, right? So brick and mortar locations do really well call extensions. Businesses that have a ton of inbound leads reaching out via the phone do really well with call extensions. And the greatest thing about it is that it works differently on mobile and desktop. So on desktop, it's just going to show your number, essentially. On mobile, what you get is this awesome call button, which allows the user to call your company directly from the ad itself. And you're charged in the same way that you're charged if someone clicks on your link and gets to your website. Um, we work with a lot of companies, again, that do a lot of business through phone, you know, phone leads, essentially. And I only want people to call me through this ad. I'm only going to serve it on mobile. And the, the phone calls are sort of, sort of racking in. And you're probably going to do this in a second. You're able to actually track how many people are calling through this feature. So that you can say, I spent X number of dollars on AdWords this week, and we saw 100 phone calls from this specific ad. So again, you're able to track those phone leads as they're coming in um, through Google's uh, forwarding phone number extension. So if you're going to listen to like three things, this is definitely one of them, because it's something really easy to get wrong, and it's one of the best features. So again, add extensions tab, bring it to call extensions. I don't know why they have call out extensions and call extensions, but we just went over call out, this is call out extensions. So go to call, very similar head plus extension, plus new phone number. And this is where it gets tricky. So that you type right here the phone number you want it to be connected to. So I'm going to use my phone number here. Now here is where it gets confusing. You can use a Google forwarding number or your own phone number. If you want your own phone number to show up, select your own phone number. Keep in mind this will not give you any reporting. You can't track how many phone calls you're getting, how long the phone calls are, what area code they're coming from, what day or ad group or keyword they're coming from. However, if you do use a Google forwarding number, it used to be a dollar per call, totally free now. What they'll do is they'll change your number to a, they'll keep your area code, but change the rest of your phone number. So when a user clicks it, it might not look like your number, but it will go right to your number. So it'll route you to your number. Um, a lot of times on mobile, it's just to click the call button. So not going to know the difference. And to be honest, unless you're like a doctor or you have a number that's very unique, like 1866 ad hoc, no one stores numbers. So it doesn't really matter. Most advertisers do keep it on their Google voting number. What they don't have to do, though, is see how many phone calls they're actually getting. And that's like the whole reason to use the Google voting number. So let me show you. I want to use the Google voting number. I'm going to hit save and save again. You'll see that it's active. Now, using the Google voting number, you want to track how many phone calls you're getting. So what you do is you go to the dimensions tab right here. It says view day. It says if you view day, you bring it down to call details. Now, obviously, I haven't had any phone calls yet, but what you'll start to see then is the start and end time, status, how long the phone call was, the area code, um, the call type, and the call source, and how much that phone call cost would be. That's like the first click. The really awesome thing about this is if you ever see the call type saying desktop, it'll say desktop or mobile. If you get a phone call via desktop, you actually got that for free. Google's not going to charge you if someone sees your phone number on desktop. It's not a click the call button. It's just your phone number. So if you call, someone calls that number, they didn't click on the ad. So you won't be charged. So any desktop phone calls you see on here, you got for zero dollars. Uh, so that's a really interesting tip. Um, this is like the dashboard you see all of the phone calls you're getting. And if you if you have someone that answers phone calls, you can mix and match and say what customer was that, what did they do, how much did we sell them, so on and so forth. But I would highly suggest using Google's tracking number rather than a third party. It works really well with AdWords. It's great. Um, and you do a lot of interesting things with it. The big problem is people keep Google voting number and they freak out and they don't see their number. 
and you don't know what's going on, and they call someone like us and ask us, that's because you selected a Google Photo number. So really know the difference between those two, but I would suggest you begin. So the last extension we're going to cover today is location extension. So again, this, this works really well for brick and mortar locations for a couple of different reasons. Your, your, your address is shown in the ad itself, and then it's also shown on a Google map in sort of a form. Um, and it, it can do a lot to sort of increase your click rate. So on average, we see about a 10% increase in click rate for people that add in location extensions. This is one of those things also that like might not be the best fit for you, right? If you're like an e-commerce business that does all of their transactions online and no one's ever coming into your office, Probably, you know, probably want to think about using it or not. Um, if you're willing to give that information out to people that are looking at your ads, setting it up is a, it's a little bit painful. They've sort of changed the way that you're able to set this up, um, and so I can walk you through it right now. But uh, how many people have like a brick and mortar business or would be interested in showing their okay, one person? I don't want to save time. Do you want to? <laughs> well, I'll just show it quickly. So you go to add extensions again. Again, just strap down as your best friend with all the different types of extensions. You bring it to location plus extension. So what this does is it matches with your Google Places account. So if you already have a Google Places account, it'll just pull directly from that. Unfortunately, they force you to use Google Places. So if you don't have Google Places and it's not to date, your location will be wrong. So all I'll have to do is save, and it's going to sync with my Google Places account, or it's called Google My Business now. And it'll say with my email address what address I put in there and pull it. So before you do this, I would go to Google My Business and just make sure your address is accurate. Because um, the worst thing you want to do is send it to a different address. The other thing is it only shows if the user is within 20 miles of your location. So if they're 300 miles away, they're not going to, the location will pop up. Right. So if you do have a place that people can drop by, it might be useful just for local. So you would say, I don't have any locations. All right, so really quickly, we want to go over how to maximize your ROI with ad targeting. And this was like the single biggest thing that we would see uh, advertisers struggle with um, when they came to us. A lot of folks that we've worked with were global businesses and they were serving ads nationally. So you can imagine how much money they wasted serving their local plumber's ad in, in Chicago when their business was in Wyoming. Um, you need to get this right, and, and there's a bunch of things that you can do and a lot of granularity um, that you can sort of find yourself getting into. We're going to cover a little bit of it today, just for the sake of time, you might want to. I'll run through a couple of them, but this is, again, one of those really important things that I would highly suggest you guys keeping note about. Because you can have the best words and the best ads. If you're targeting your own people, not going to be much for you. So all this is going to be stored in settings. Settings is one of your best friends here. So let's go to settings and locations. I'm showing just in San Francisco right now. Let's say I, my target markets are San Francisco, LA, and Boulder. I want to hit plus locations, and I probably want to add in Los Angeles and Boulder. Now, in this screen, you can do some really crazy things, some things that are super interesting. You can hit advanced search right here. Location groups. And what this will actually allow you to do, target people based on income. So you can target people based on income level or around an airport. I don't know why this isn't dropping down, but in that drop down, you can pick people around the airport, type in the airport, people in this income demographic, and type in the income demographic. You can also do college campus is another good one. So we see a lot of people that are producing some sort of like social app, target specific um, college campuses, and just crush ads for those locations. Um, and really get as much value as they can from that one spot. Again, it, this is the best strategy if you know a lot about your users. Um, you just really do as much as you can to target those people specifically, then a larger group of people that may or may not be for you. There it is. So you drop this down, go to places of interest, and you can type in a location based on airport, send a commercial area or your university. So if I do airport, I can really target anyone at your airport. So you can imagine for taxis, that's like the best thing ever, or you know, every nuanced business. Um, and then you can do demographics, where you can literally type in household income here. So if you want the top 10% of income, uh, lower 50%, you can target them as well. Now after you set up all this targeting, just add older, save it. 
you'll see I have two locations, Boulder and San Francisco. Well, I'm actually more interested in the Boulder clients. Boulder clients are worth more to me. I want more of them than in San Francisco. You'll see that there's this little hyphen to the right. Click on it. So I can increase my bids by 25%, whatever you want to do, for certain locations. So I can say, hey, I want to spend $2 per click, but people in Boulder are more important. I want to increase these bids by 10%. And maybe people in San Francisco are important, but I'm willing to spend, I want to spend 65% less on that. So using these adjustments is really, really crucial. Um, you've got to know the value of someone in Boulder versus the value of someone in San Francisco. Uh, and you can decrease and increase those based on the numbers you see here or what you know about your business. So again, this is using the information here. You can also drill into location reports. We probably won't have any data because this is a new account, but if you're running your campaigns for a couple of weeks, you can see a list of every location where your ad was clicked and compare the data against all of those locations. So if I have a surfboard company and I'm crushing my ads in San Diego, but in Boulder where there's no lakes or oceans or anything, I'm, I'm not seeing any sort of um, increase, it's just a lot of clicks and no purchases. I want to I want to think about swapping those budgets, right? Maybe like if I was doing, do a negative bid adjustment to Boulder, increasing the bid adjustment to San Diego. Yeah, so check this out. So we have a business that wants to target mostly San Francisco, but we want to target a couple of areas. What's interesting is, yes, we want to target San Francisco, but what kind of we're paying in cost per click in our secondary cities? 52 cents in Austin, 79 cents in Washington. The computer has no idea how you value all of these, so it's just gonna kind of do its own thing. So if I really only, if San Francisco is one of my primary targets, I would want to increase this by a certain percentage and go in here and decrease this by I don't know, 50%. So the account I showed you before had no data. This is a little bit easier to see with data. You'll really want to look at conversion. That's the most important thing. Um, we have zero, but it's because it's a test account. But that's what you want to look at here. So second thing is ad schedule. So my ads are showing every single day of the week, but some people want day parted. So you only want it during certain hours, certain days. You can do the same thing here with the bid adjustments. If weekdays are better for you, increase bid adjustments on weekdays, decrease on weekends. But I want to show you how to do day parting. So you can plus ad schedule, and then literally all you do is change the date and the times in there. So if you only want your ad showing from 5 to 5 or 4 to 3, whatever it is, make sure you change it here. As soon as you change it, it'll be reflected. As you can see, Monday got changed a bit. These are all day. And Monday is my best day, so I actually want to increase that by 70%. Again, these are the bids. This isn't your budget. You're not saying I want to spend 70% more. You're saying per click, I'll spend 70% more, which in turn will show you higher on the page. So this is not budget, this will not increase your budget whatsoever. The last thing is devices. People always get this wrong, but there is no good way not to show on computers and only tablets. But this is how you can see how you do on each device. Um, if you look at my cost per clicks, they're about one tenth of the click per computers. That's really interesting to me. Uh, so what I can do is, oh, mobile devices are more important to me. I can increase this by 200%. If you want to get off mobile devices completely, this is the only way to do it. You go in here and it decreases by 100%. That's like the workaround to getting off mobile devices completely. Google doesn't like to advertise that because they want you to be on mobile. But if you never want to show on mobile, settings devices decrease by 100, you'll never show. Uh, but some businesses want to be plus 250. You can go up to plus 300. You know, if you're a taxi, you probably want to be plus 250. Yeah, we've seen a lot too of. Uh, and you can include it in the slide where you, you sort of want to have a mobile optimized version of your site in order to sort of do mobile advertising effectively. At the same time, we've seen clients that don't have mobile optimized versions of their sites perform pretty well. You, again, just want to look at the data and sort of listen to it and do what it's telling you to do. So our, our example is, you know, our average cost per click is super low on mobile. We're going to increase our bid adjustment to continue riding that that way. So, one, so settings, you can do locations, data, week, and devices. That's the type of adjustments you can do in settings. They're really crucial. Now there's one other tab. We went over ads, we went over ad extensions. The only other tab I would really take a look at is this display network tab. This is for display campaigns only. If you're running a search campaign, you can tune this out. But if you're running a display campaign, and that's other websites out there, there's some really interesting targeting you can do with this. You click demographics, and all of a sudden, you can see what the demographics of the people that are clicking on you. So gender. Again, you can change the CPCs. 
Uh, and you can change the CBC, so I want to date more on males, less on females. Maybe we don't want to bid on females, so you can get removed. Maybe we don't want to bid on males, you can remove. You can check the age of all the people clicking on your ads. So this is really good market research to see who's clicking my ads the most. And then you can actually also see parental status. I have no idea why they decided to show you this information, but in case you want to target just parents, you can do pause these and only show the parents. So you can do these all with a display campaign. You cannot do it with a uh, search campaign. So again, settings has locations, ad schedule devices, display network has a lot of demographic data on your users. Yep. I will send this out. So demystifying quality scores was one of those things that before I worked at Google, it was the, the biggest frustration, right? Because you create these campaigns, you like, I don't know how much you guys know about this, but we'll go over it in a second. Quality score drives most of the things with an AdWords, right? It'll sort of tell you how much you should be bidding, it, it'll sort of indicate where you rank, people type in your keywords, et cetera. And when you have a low quality score, you're usually paying more and ranking lower. Um, I would spend hours trying to figure this out, and then when I got the job at Google, I was like, yes, finally, I will know the secret behind quality score. And when I finally figured it out, I was like, Jesus, that so easy, it's so simple, and if you just do a couple of things, um, when you first set up your account, you're gonna see high quality scores for the duration of your campaigns. So, and just so you know, quality scores are important because, and let me go take a step back. You go, you yeah. yeah, so do you want to cover why they're important? Yeah, so on, a, on Google search, there's three ads up top, five on the side. So you're gonna get an average position. It's one of the columns that are standard in Google. It's gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One is obviously the best position, eight is the worst position. Now you can bid higher to get higher, or you can do a quality score. So the way your average position works is it's your bid times your quality score. Okay, so bid times quality score, and quality score is made up of how closely related your ads and your keywords are, your landing page experience, and there's a bunch of other stuff that we'll get into in just a second, but it, there's like 200 factors, right? So one of the things when I joined Google was like, you know, there's all these things that go into quality score, but here are the most important two. The, the really the, the one thing that you guys should should know and, and really optimize against is, uh, is relevancy. Relevancy is the biggest driver for success, and that basically means that when I type in the keyword women's hats, the ads I'm going to see will direct me to a website where I can buy women's hats. Um, Google places a lot of value in that relevancy, and, and that's where most of the, the sort of algorithms in the quality score are sort of weighted towards. Um, real quick before we move on to the next slide. So it's a, it's a one to 10 scale that you're ranked on. I would get sevens all the time and I thought they were terrible. Seven is actually a really good quality score. Um, and that, that should be like the, the sort of smallest number that you'll want to see in that in that area. Uh, eight, nine, and 10 are really good. That's if you just move to, to optimize your campaign to get to that point. You'll see those. That's where you can see it. So if you go to your keywords tab, you can see what your quality scores are right now and what's affecting them. So for instance, this one's a five out of 10. It's saying that my expected click through rate is low. That means my cost per click is probably too low for what I should have been. Um, and these change every single day. So you can go through these and, and take a look at what your quality source is. This one's obviously really bad. So we should look at it away, which is why they're barely showing this keyword. Because their you know, quality scores are so low. But you can imagine if you're if you're Microsoft and Google wants to bid on your keyword, wants to bid on Microsoft, their quality scores are gonna be a two out of ten or three out of ten. They're going to have to spend 5x for that word to try to beat you out. So it's really good to kind of find out your competitors. They'll have to spend a lot more because it's not as relevant. But you do want to keep this in check to make sure your quality scores are always above 6%. Yeah. And we'll go into right now how, how you ensure that that actually happens. Um, and it takes a little bit of time, right? Like that, there's no way around it. So again, Google values relevancy. It's the most important thing that's weighted in the quality score algorithm. And we like to use the analogy of threading a needle. So you want a common thread to run through every single aspect of your Google AdWords uh, ads. So it starts with a keyword, and then sort of threads through the ad text, and then onto your landing page. So if I, again, using women's hats as an example, if that was my keyword, I would want that to be the keyword. I want the ad text to say something about women's hats, both in the clickable line of text, and then also maybe in the display URL. Uh, and then I want the landing page to call that out a couple of times. 
that will help Google to understand how relevant your site is and will cause your quality score to increase. So the one keyword trick is a little time consuming, but I saw it work with every small advertiser that I work with. It's basically creating an ad group that has one keyword in it and one ad in it. And again, it's the only thing that will allow Google to sort of um, run their algorithms again. So if I had women's hats as an example, the keyword would be women's hats, the ad uh, text would be um, something about women's hats and the landing page would take them to women's hats. But that would be the only keyword in that ad group. There would be nothing else trying to compete for that at all. Definitely time consuming, but you're guaranteeing yourself very high quality towards it. The one is dramatic, you can do two or three, right? But keep them very closely in. Right. All right. The admin secrets everyone should know. We're going to go over these pretty quickly and then open it up for questions. Um, we covered some of them already. So Google, this is the biggest frustration that I had with AdWords. It's like an important feature, bury that shit in a tab. Every single thing that was important was typically buried like three or four steps into a tab. And it's why most users never really interacted with it. So we actually went over a bunch of these. We could probably just cover Gmail ads. But the, the sort of three most important things that you guys can take a look at is the search terms report. And basically, the search terms report will show you what keywords caused your ads to trigger and yeah, you know, for a second. Yeah. So if you look, so we're in the, this is the search report. This is like the number one thing I show every single advertiser that actually blows their mind. So I'm a search campaign, here are my keywords. You see these are broad matched, these are broad matched modified. So these words are probably triggering a bunch of different things, variations, like I said, synonyms, misspellings. So what I actually want to do is, what are people actually searching in Google? It's not these exact words. You go to details, search term call. This will actually tell you what exactly people are typing into Google. This will surprise you because if you have broad match, it could be a lot of different things. So for example, I put advertising dashboard in broad match, it triggered an advertising alliance. I don't know who that is, but that's one of the problems with running broad match. So what you can do from this report, let's say I don't want to show AdWords MCC or Electronic Market Washington. I don't want to show for these. It has a negative keyword. It has a negative keyword here. Save. Exclude it. So if you do run broad match campaigns because you're not sure what your users type in, make sure you check this report because you're going to have really strange things coming up. But then let's say I love digital targeting. That's a really good one. You can do the opposite. You can check box that and add. That's the easiest way to save money. Like if you're running a campaign and you're not checking this, that's a problem. You can imagine is the more you go through and exclude, the more tightly knit your campaign is going to be and the more efficient it will be. So another thing that we saw when working with startups is that they would have this really awesome piece of tech, right? It was something revolutionary. And they struggled hard with trying to figure out what keywords were the ones that were really successful. Like how, how do you get someone that doesn't know about X, Y, and Z to search for it online? Um, a lot of that is through experimentation using Etc. But some of that comes after a couple weeks of running your campaigns by looking at the search terms report and seeing the interaction. Right? If you see a keyword that you haven't added in as an official keyword that causes your ad to trigger and a lot of people are engaging with it and converting, you're going to want to make that an official keyword so that you can do things like increase the bids and, and all that other good stuff. Just the last thing, this is another thing I make sure you remember. Uh, if you have an account manager at Google, if you don't know, you can call Google at 1 2 Google and figure out if you do have one. But if you do have one, they have access to a ton of different things, including betas and special products. Um, one of the big ones out there that a lot of people are using are Gmail ads. Um, so Gmail ads allow you to target, you've probably seen the ads in the promotion tab um, of your Gmail. They are brand new, they should be rolling out sometime um, in the near future. Um, if you have an account manager, they might be able to give you access to it. What they allow you to do is target, target advertisers based on the words in their email or who they're getting emails from. So for us, anyone getting emails from adwords.google.com, we probably want to show ads to. Anyone that's saying AdWords agency in their email, we want to show ads to. So there's a lot of these different types of campaigns that if you have an account manager, it's a really easy way to utilize them to say, hey, what are the different types of betas? Um, what are the things out there? But as you guys know, you've seen the ads in Gmail um, in your promotions tab, and that's something that could be utilized as well. But use those account managers for stuff like that and bouncing questions on them. That's what they're there for. The biggest thing about these new features like Gmail ads or even YouTube, it's only been out for a couple years, is that people are just notoriously slow to adopt new campaign types. 
And so for Gmail ads, because of some data, there's tons of inventory, and everything is ridiculously cheap. So we could get clicks at 10 cents or 5 cents by running keywords that are, you know, maybe like three or four bucks on search, because there's just not many people interacting with it. And so you want to take advantage of that as fast as you can um, in getting hooked up in those situations. So that's it for us. Um, we, we hope that this helps a little bit, but we also know that advertising online is like ridiculously confusing for all of the reasons that we sort of outlined here. Tons of tabs, tons of things to learn, tons of steps to take to get to your solution. One of the reasons why we created that app. Um, just to make that process a lot simpler for folks that can. Yeah, so we're working on software to make this a lot easier, but we do want to open it up for as many questions as possible. I know obviously there's a couple of uh, yeah. people out. We had a couple on Twitter. Um, what's the relationship between AdWords and search engine optimization? So I would say that there isn't much. However, I've seen people use AdWords for SEO. In terms of SEO, it takes into account relevant traffic that comes to your website. So if you're pushing relevant traffic to your website, that's great. But keep in mind, organic relevant traffic is more valuable to SEO than paid traffic. So it's going to help you fractionally, but not really that big. So I, I wouldn't <clears throat> take that into account when looking at SEO at all. Also, we have, what's the max precision for map targeting? So how, how a granular? Specific, yeah, how granular. You can get all the way down to a zip code. Um, so you can target a small zip code. You can also, and because we have that specific of a question. I was actually just playing with that. You can do zip plus four. Yeah. So yeah. another thing you can do is, again, when you're in settings and locations, when you hit plus locations and advanced search, you can do radius targeting. So I want to target this zip code, and I want to move one mile around it. So you can target a specific zip code and just make your own radius around it. So that's probably as granular as you can get, um, but you can overlay with a couple of other things, like only on Thursdays, only on mobile devices, and that should be really granular. Uh, at least there might be also, this is one of them, yeah. But you can also get it down to the Nielsen rated neighborhoods. They have it down by a neighborhood. Um, but I would just use it to go to the Nielsen Yeah, so what are the, Various things that influence uh, how much a bid or click is, like how much the bid costs. Quality score is huge. Um, how what the competition is. So, for instance, I'll give you the, some examples. If you're a locksmith and you want to bid on the word locksmith, it'll probably cost you fifteen dollars a click. If you want to bid on emergency locksmith, that'll probably cost you twenty-five dollars a click. If someone that types in emergency locksmith is more it has a higher likelihood of actually converting. So it depends on the word you type in. Um, but the higher the converting type of word, the more it'll cost. I've seen ones up to $150 per click, like emergency flood insurance. Um, but you can imagine if someone types in emergency flood insurance, it's really about how much someone else is willing to pay for it. But the way to get around that is just have a good quality score. So have really tight in ads that match your keywords, that match your landing page, and you should be able to get something that works pretty well. That long tail keywords you can play around with a little bit, which is just basically instead of doing, you know, uh, emergency flood insurance, you got a couple more sort of modified keywords to that and hope to catch the people that are typing in a little bit longer of a, of a search query. Um, that's hit or miss, but you should definitely uh, you know, try that out on the data to see what converts best for you. Any questions from the audience? Any other questions? Anything we can, yeah. I imagine that like trying to compete in San Francisco is a more competitive location than other areas? Is there a way to find out how competitive a location is? Yeah, I mean, you could, it, a lot of this is based on uh, testing, but as you can see in one of these, I'm sure, um, so when you go into settings and locations, you can see how competitive each market is. There you go. So you can see the different cost per clicks for all the locations. They're all the same keywords, but here it's 10 cents, here it's 11, here it's 14, here it's 13. So I showed you one before that was a little bit more dramatic. Um, this is a little bit less dramatic because it's Gmail ads and they're a little bit more stable right now. But I've seen like 150% differences based on locations. So again, that's where you use these adjustments, and they have 100 plus 20 plus 50. Do you have another question? That's the one that you answered. I'm just trying to understand. I 
that's a really that's a good question. So there's one way of doing it. There's one roundabout way of doing it. You need to have a search campaign. So I can show you. I don't have enough data to populate data, but if you go to the keywords tab on a search campaign, and you click details, this is the search term report I was talking about before. So that's all the words that, that trigger your ad. This will tell you every company that's also bidding on that word and tell you their impression share. So it'll say, this company is 60% ownership of this word, this company is 20% ownership of this word, you have this percent. So would you click under search terms all to see that? Uh, no, so search terms all is that search term report. So this is what's triggering your ad right now. So this is what's triggering this account's ad. What you want to do, if you do want to see that competitive data, you click details, auction data sites. I'm not going to have enough data to show you. Yeah, but, but it'll show you the domain they're coming from, their impression share, whatever position they have. Uh, yeah, and your position above, right? And this is really complicated. We'd love if there's a lot of more detailed questions, tweet us, email us, come find us in the TechStars office. We're always sitting down with people trying to help because there's a million things like that that we could talk about, but we don't have enough time. Yeah, this is very much the foundation level of AdWords, and it's, again, super complicated, but there's there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with this data and really manipulate it to work for you. And the best advertisers that we worked with did this really well, and it was like an ATM, and I think the money in is how to work out. So. Yeah, anything else we can help answer? Even anything that relates to your business? Yeah. I struggled with this. Um, I'll start a campaign. It crushes it for two or three weeks, and then it quickly just starts to go so that and we work around that, and I call support, and they sort of don't really have any concrete suggestions. So I just start a new campaign, and we just sort of cycle through that. Have you seen that before? So I have seen that. What I would take a look at is the beginning of the campaign, which you're going to get a standard 7 out of 10 quality score, 6 out of 10. It takes like a week or two for it to start really analyzing. My biggest bet is that they started analyzing your quality scores now went down. So I would just take a look at the quality scores. Another thing is refreshing your ads every couple of weeks is a good thing to do. Uh, but I would bet it's quality score. And very good point, though. People don't realize you can call Google. If you're an advertiser, you can call Google at any time and answer any question you want. Again, just one eight six six two Google. They will answer any question, any time, any day. Uh, people don't realize that there's actually a fault line to call this. Yeah, they try to hide it. So, <laughs> anything else? Are there certain uh, specific parameters that you might set broader in the beginning so that you have more data to see and know what's narrow, where to narrow it down? Yeah, so that's a strategy. Some of the best advertisers I've seen will basically use all broad match and say, I don't know exactly what people want, but I'll use broad match and just basically see what happens. So I did that with this campaign. I used all broad match. I, this is ridiculous, I set up. But I used all broad match for the sake of the example. And then what you could do is you could a detailed search terms all. I would track it by conversions, but we're not tracking conversions in this. So let's track it by clicks. Well, I had three clicks on this one, and let's pretend this data looks a little different. But I can see what people are really typing in, and then I can either A, set up a new campaign with these specific words, or just do the add and exclude. So I can say I want to add these, or I want to exclude these. So it is a strategy to start at the beginning with broad match. Just keep in mind, you may feel like you're wasting money, but really it's like a market research type thing for a week. And then the point of it would be to decide what works well, what doesn't work well. I would actually start a new campaign. Because if you have fresh data, fresh click through rates, fresh relevancy scores, and just pick the top 10 or 15 and just start writing. Yeah, like Todd said, some of the best advertisers we've worked with would give themselves a test budget, you know, like five grand or thousand dollars, whatever it was, and they would do this and just figure out, it was like a research thing, um, what, what can I actually do within these confines? And then once they had that core set of information, they just scaled really quickly with that. You're the one with the brick and mortar location, right? Or, so what we've seen work from a targeting perspective for brick and mortar locations um, that are using something like a location extension um, is radius targeting, which is basically setting a radius around your business at let's say five miles, right? And then another around around 50 miles or 20 miles, you can sort of play with the numbers. And then the, the sort of idea is the people that are five miles around your business are probably most likely to stop by. And so you want to bid really aggressively in that horrible target. And then as you go outside of those rings, you get a little bit more uh, lenient. So it's like maybe 10 percent good adjustment, one for the out, so we keep that as a status quo. Um, but it's the best way to capture attention within the sort of area that you want to. It works really well for like retail locations, restaurants, clubs, etc. So 
like, I just did that quickly, but you could add, see, I had a radius of one mile around my location, 10 miles around my location, bid up 50% on these people, bid down a little on these people, but I still want to show them up for that. So say it was like, say it was a hotel, so it could be people out of state or just a long ways away. Would you want to actually include your uh, location in the keywords? Or like the state and city yeah. in your keywords? Yeah, because you want people in Texas who are searching Boulder um, Hotel, right, to see you. So what I would do there is plus sign Boulder and then leave hotel by itself. So they can say hotel, Airbnb, stay, lodging, because you want a variation of that. But you want to make sure Boulder is there or some sort of stuff. So I would do it like that. In, in terms of targeting then, you might want to just do the states that are most important to you and then go from there. But at the same time, if someone's within 10 miles for you searching for a hotel, you probably want to bid up on them. So that's where you probably want to do something like this and bid up on those people because they are like right next door. Uh, and we can help you with that if you have more questions. So anything else we can help to? You said this is going to be on, it's going to be recorded on Periscope, you guys are also going to offer yeah, so we'll, we'll share the slides. We also, what we did was we did every single one of these tabs, the walkthrough, um, on YouTube. We can send that off as well. It's just ad hoc on YouTube. You can find all the videos on there. But we're like pretty active on Twitter, so if you ever have a question, you just tweet at me and use the hashtag ask ad hoc. We get back to you in like an hour. Yeah. Um, and my email is Todd at Tradhoc. This is Dan at Tradhoc. So feel free to utilize that. We're pretty open for any questions. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks,